constant dialogue going on in the mind. This is this, and that's that, and this should be this, and that should be that. And you like this, and you don't like that. All kinds of voices. In a lot of cases, the voices are totally uneducated. They're just things we picked up from here or there. And we carry them around, and this is the baggage in our mind. The Buddha said the mind can be at peace only when there's only one there. But for most of us, it's two, three, four, five, six voices all going at it, carrying all their preconceptions, saying, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And unless you examine them, they, you find that they can force you to suffer in a lot of ways. Some of the things we hold to, not so much that we like them, it's because we're afraid that if we don't hold on to them, something bad is going to happen. Or if we don't do things this way or that way, something bad is going to happen. And we hold on to it and force ourselves to, to create suffering for ourselves in this way. This is why when the mind begins to settle down. This is one of the big issues you've got to deal with, is the different voices in the mind that get in the way of it settling down. Some of them are just random voices. Others more, more insistent, more pervasive. More in control. And you've got to learn how to put a question mark next to them. Anything that gets in the way of the concentration, put a question mark. Do you really believe that? Is that kind of thinking really right? Is it really useful? That's what it comes down to. How useful is that kind of thinking? Then you begin to see how much you hold on to without it that you haven't really examined in the past. You just accepted it because other people said it was true, or it sounded right, or maybe it worked once. And then you hold on to that as a habit. And it's always amazing as the mind begins to settle down, just the things that come up. The ideas, the presuppositions. That's why, as we were saying earlier today, when the passage from the Buddha said, there's no jhana without discernment, no discernment without jhana. No solid concentration without understanding, no understanding without solid concentration. The two have to go together. In other words, you have to have some understanding of the workings of the mind before the, you can really settle down. Because otherwise you'll fall for all the old tricks that the mind's been playing on itself. Say, you've got to think about this, you've got to get involved in that, you can't re neglect this, you've got to look into that. And you've got to be able to see through those voices. It's just what they are, just sort of disembodied voices floating around there in the mind. And learn how to put a question mark, say, I wonder if that's really true. And then just put it aside and go, go about your work, focusing on the breath. And then as your mind gets more and more still, more and more quiet, you begin to see these voices in more clarity. And other voices that have been hiding under the surface begin to come up to the surface. So this is how these two processes help each other. The more quiet you are, the more you can see. The more you see, the more you're able to keep the mind quiet. Which is why there is no such thing as a separate tranquility technique or a separate vipassana technique. Any technique you have, anything that you will the mind into, focusing on or doing. That's a concentration technique. You can do concentration. You can't do insight. Insight is something that arises when the mind gets still, and many times it's unexpected. You can't map it out saying, well, first you're going to gain this insight, and then you're going to gain that insight. These things vary from person to person, what you happen to notice as you're doing your work. It's like the difference between an artisan and an artist. An artisan just has a particular technique, a particular craft that he uses, and he may get very good at it, but unless he gets the kind of understanding that develops it into develops the art, just stays as that, a craftsman, craftswoman. But if you begin to notice things, you say, well, how about this? Well, how about that? Questioning this, questioning that, trying this, trying that. It's that element of ingenuity in the practice that 
makes all the difference. When you don't keep following the same old patterns or falling for the same old ideas over and over again, when you learn to question them. This is why it's so important to be able to come out to a place like this where you can get out of your ordinary ruts and begin to air out the mind. And start questioning the attitudes that seem to work so well in your daily life. But when you begin to take them apart, realize that you're creating an awful lot of unnecessary suffering for yourself. The Buddha points out that simply living as a human being involves pain. There's the pain of the body. There's the pain of having to be dependent on things. We have this body that needs sustenance. And in order to get sustenance, we have to work. Other people have to work. It's a real burden. That's simply a part of aging, birth, aging, illness, and death. But there's a lot of suffering that's totally unnecessary, the stuff that we inflict on ourselves through our own lack of skill in managing our minds. And that's something we can work on in the meditation, learning how to deal more skillfully with issues as they come up, and recognizing patterns of thought that are skillful that don't lead to suffering, and ones that are unskillful that, le that do lead to suffering. Learning how to stop acting and thinking and speaking in unskillful ways. That's what our practice is all about. When we stop doing unskillful things and the unnecessary suffering we inflict on ourselves just gets less and less and less. Until it reaches a point where we don't do it anymore. We don't make ourselves suffer. There's maybe still feelings of pain in the body, but there's no suffering in the mind. So the practice is one of developing skill. Back in ancient cultures, they used to make a division between two types of knowledge. There's warrior knowledge and there's scribe knowledge. Scribe knowledge is the things that you can put down in words. Knowledge that can be defined in terms of words. Warrior knowledge is the kind of knowledge that comes from acting, from developing a skill. And as you can imagine, the kind of knowledge we're working on here is warrior knowledge. We learn the words in the text so we can get a basic idea. But the actual knowledge itself that we're working on is, one, is what comes from developing the mind. It's called pavana mayapanya in Pali. In other words, as you try to develop concentration in the mind, you begin to realize things about the mind you didn't realize before. As you develop mindfulness, as you develop persistence, all these qualities that you work on cultivating, when you do it, you begin to see things about the mind that were hidden previously. That's the kind of insight, the kind of discernment that's really going to make a difference. So as you're meditating, think of yourself as a warrior. You're working on skill. You've the survival of the mind with as little suffering as possible. That's what you're working towards. And a lot of strange ideas about people have picked up about warriors that you go in to attack everything as soon as it arises. That's a dumb warrior. An intelligent warrior takes on battles only when he realizes that he can win them and they're worth winning. And at the same time, he uses, or she uses, whatever is at hand. I talked today about having to fall back on Bhutto as being sort of primary school meditation technique. Well, if that's what you need, don't be too ashamed to use it. A good warrior isn't ashamed to use any weapon that works. Whatever weapons are needed for the task at hand, for the battle at hand, those are the ones you've got to use. Which is why a good meditator has lots of tools, lots of weapons on hand. Because the defilements, when they come, they don't all come in one shape or in one form. They don't attack from the same side. Sometimes they come from this side, sometimes they come from that side. Sometimes the mind feels lazy, other times it turns on itself and starts browbeating itself. Well, that's also a defilement, if it's not helpful for the meditation. This is when it gets really tricky, because many times the defilements can defi dis disguise themselves as the Dharma te teaching, the Dharma talking, and you've got to watch out for that. It's when you're not quite sure what the mind is saying, whether it's true or false or skillful or unskillful, we'll just go back to being in that mode as a watcher. 
and look at the thinking in the mind simply as a process of arising, passing away, that you don't have to get involved with. And at the very least, you'll find that you'll survive whatever that state of mind is. And oftentimes you'll have a chance to understand it. You'll begin to see, well, this goes with that, that goes with this. When you think in this way, this is going to happen. When you think in that way, that's going to happen. And as you gain that kind of understanding, then the next time it comes around, you're better armed, better prepared for it. So as you meditate, you've got lots of techniques. You've got bhutto, you've got the breath. You've got your ability to analyze things when analysis works. You've got your ability to turn it off when that doesn't work. In other words, as a meditator, you've got to be skilled in lots of ways. But what it comes down to is whatever works in clearing up the suffering of the mind, that keeps the mind from creating burdens for itself. Whatever technique works, that qualifies as the Dharma. Whether or not it's in the text, whether or not you've heard it from the teacher, you find as you look back on it that the things that work all tend to fall under particular patterns. But the techniques that work may not necessarily be the ones that you'd expect, because most of where do your expectations come from? It comes from your past ignorance, in addition to your past knowledge. And so when all the things you've read in the books don't work, just sit down and look at the problem. Use your ingenuity to find some way around it. And if it works, you've learned some new dharma. In other words, if it works in alleviating the unnecessary suffering that the mind creates for itself. Because as you stop creating suffering for yourself, you find it easier to be good with other people as well. This is why it's not a selfish practice. And the principle of loving-kindness is not just an idle wish or say, may all living beings be happy. It also means actually being kind to yourself, not creating this unnecessary suffering that you pile on yourself all the time. And when you find that your mind is less piled on like this, it's easier to feel some sympathy for the other people who are piling stuff on their minds as well. That's why the benefits of the practice go not only inward but also outward. But the essence of the issue, where the real work has to be done, is right here inside. Finding where those unnecessary burdens are, the, the burdensome ideas, the burdensome things the mind tells itself it has to do this and has to think like that. And figure out how to let them go. It's a gift not only to yourself, but it's to the people around you.